canal tours around the canals of Copenhagen. First, some very important safety information, because as you can see up in front, there's a very low bridge. We have 15 of those that we need to go under. So in order to make it out alive, it's very important we follow some rules. Number one, please remain seated throughout the entire trip from start to finish. Number two, please keep your elbows on the inside of the boat at all times, and please do not touch the bridges as we go under them. There's no smoking or vaping allowed on board, and in case you should need it, you will find your life vests underneath each of your seats. But we won't be needing those because you are in luck of being sailed around by the handsome, the capable, the magnificent Captain Carl. Can everyone give a big hand for your captain of today? Thank you very much. Now, the bridge coming up straight ahead is the first one, and it is the lowest one. And we have a national pastime here in Copenhagen where we drink too much Carlsberg, we like to pee on our bridges a lot. So if you want to keep your fingers squeaky clean with no urine on them, please do not touch the bridges. Thank you very much. Now, lean back and enjoy this ride underneath a nice, cool, calm Danish summer. You might have get rain on you already. This is a perfect local integration experience of a Danish summer in all its glory. And you are having the pleasure of being sailed through the very last trip of today. Let's see if we all survive this very low bridge. You wanna touch, you wanna touch, you wanna touch so bad. Thank you for not touching, ladies and gents. Congratulations on your clean fingers. Now, what's going on? Where are we? My name is Michael, and we are currently sailing through the canals of Nuhal. Nuhal. And back then, this entire area was filled with sailors who were mostly running around, getting drunk, and getting into fights, enjoying the many ladies of the night around these canals. Today it's a slightly more tame, family-friendly area where we sip capillata, eat overpriced ice cream and enjoy something called smabble. Can you all say smabble? No. Smabble. Smabble is the open-ended sandwich of the Danes and we are going to be talking about it at the end of our trip. But, ladies and gents, this is my seventh time today. 11 hours and I thrive of positive energy. So, is everyone ready for a canal tour? Yeah! Thank you a lot. <laughs> Ladies and gents, left hand side, you're gonna see the first architectural gem in this country. Over here to your left, we have the Royal Playhouse of Denmark. Opened up in 2008 in that year, February, where it opened with the Shakespearean play Hamlet, which takes place in Denmark. You might be knowing it from the iconic lines, to be or not to be. Or as you say in Denmark, two beers or not two beers. Not all the jokes are great. So, up in front, you see these great pyramid shapes of modern architecture. This sits on top of something called Paper Island. Paper Island was built 200 years ago to store cannon fire. Then, in the 90s, we put a bunch of paper in there for newspapers, hence the name Paper Island. Later, it got bought up by hipsters who do a brewery and food halls. We kicked them to the other side of the canal, and now you can see the food market in all its hipster glory down to the right. It got bought up a final time by the elite, and now it is the most exclusive real estate in the entire country, where you too can get an apartment for no less than 10 million euros at the tippy top of Danish society. What a bargain. Now, all of these different islands you see out here, we call them Holme and it is small islands that the Danes built because back in the 1700s we had the third biggest navy in the entirety of Europe. But there is a theme that goes through the city and throughout this entire trip and that is of Copenhagen burning down. The reason we built these islands is because our fleet of course was made of wood and it's very flammable. So we removed it from the burning down city and we put it over to these different islands we created 200 years ago. The first one coming up is the Opera Park, the green you can see to your right. This is called the Upper Park, and there's four different types of seasons represented in the different types of plants that you have in there. And it's called the Upper Park because it's right next to the Opera House, which is this big structure you see in the right. The Opera House opened in 2005 and was a gift from a man named A. Camilla Mask, who's the man who gave us the biggest shipping container company in the world, Mask. He gave it to the people as a gift for half a billion dollars. And on the inside of it, you have 14 stories, five of which going underground, and the main auditorium seating 1,700 people you can see behind the window in the red color. 
It's reddish in color because it's clad in maple wood, the same sort of wood you make violins out of. And in the same way, if you slap the side of the auditorium, it will play a musical note, much like a string instrument would. At the very top, you got the roof, 25 meters high, and the Americans come every year to celebrate ball and jump off it into the harbor. The color behind, you can maybe see there are three large lamps in there in what looks like yellow or orange. Yeah, can you see it? Red background, three large circular lamps. That is no accident. You see Henning Larsen who designed this, he got into a fight with April Müller Mask who bought it and his way of saying F you to him was to make the official flag of Freetown of Christania in the foyer. A horizontal red line with three dots horizontally put. Christania, the free town, the hippie town of Christania, represented right in front of the royal residence on the other side, and made it ball for all of you to see. Every single day it gets dark, it will light up and all its glory. The biggest anti-establishment symbol we have in the country shining right in front of the queen. Now you might have noticed as you gaze out on this beautiful country that there is not a single mountain to be seen. That's because you are currently in the second flattest country on earth, only beat out by the Dutch. It is so flat because 15,000 years ago, from Sweden and Norway during the ice ages, all of the ice slid down from the mountains and squished down on Denmark flatter than a pancake. Which means that we are today the only Scandinavian country on earth with no mountains. And as you can imagine, we feel a certain type of way about that. So, ladies and gents, we did something about it. On your right hand side, in the horizon, oozing into the atmosphere, I give to you our very own man-made mountain, Copen Hill. Oozing up on top of this beast of architecture, you can ski all the way down on artificial snow every day of the year. On the side, you can climb 83 meters into the air, the tallest climbing surface in all of Europe. And by the inside of the building, we burn 550,000 tons of trash every year for green energy for 90,000 homes. We burn so much trash in there that we have to import more of it from Swedes, who apparently have no trash to spare. The oldest navy in all of the world is the Danish one, going back from the Viking Ages over a thousand years ago. What you see on the right hand side is the remnants of our great navy. The one we're going to be talking about has F-352 written on the side of it, and it is a grey battleship up in front. This is called the Los Camp and operated during the Cold War between 1966 and 88. But most Danish people know it for what happened in 1982, when in a routine check of the buttons, the captain went whoop, 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 and boom, shot a missile straight into a vacation home area, where it destroyed four summer homes. Thankfully, no one was home because it was winter, but the plot thickened a year later when we found out that one of those destroyed four summer homes belonged to the captain's ex-mother-in-law. Yeah. Either a big coincidence or one of the greatest revenge plots in Danish history. Up in front, right next to the ship, you have a naval fort with green and cannons sitting on top of it. And there you have a flagpole with a very flaccid version of our Danish flag right on top of it. This is Danibol, the red and the white flag with a cross in the middle. It is the oldest flag in the entire world. And it was given to us. We found it by the heavens. Because you see, the Pope during the Crusades, almost a thousand years ago, sent the Danes to go to war in Palestine. We just didn't want to go because it's too warm and we don't want to get sand in our boots. So, we decided to invade Estonia instead. We went there, started the war, but the war didn't end very well because we were losing. But when you know it, the skies opened up and this flag descended from the heavens and our bishop caught it with his hands. And when he held it high in the air, we were victorious in battle. When he got tired and he dropped it again, we were losing yet again. So, with help of people who held him arms up for 12 hours, we were victorious, held the flag high, and ever since, Nandipul has been our proud flag. You might be a bit skeptical about that story because they were during the Crusades, there was crosses and everything, and that is a white cross. But to that, I say, shut up, we like our stories better. This sits on top of Battery Sixtus, a sea fort with cannons pointed towards Sweden, of course, but it's also an alarm clock from the 1700s. You see, when the sun went up, we were signaling that our boats went to take the flag up and down. So we shot cannons up into the distance, and we shot it again when the sun went down. The problem with that idea is, of course, that sometimes the sun gets up at 4 a.m. in the morning, which meant that we got woken up by cannon fire every day, and so many noise complaints from the royal family piled up, and we decided Let's just say the sun gets up at 8 a.m. every day. 
On the right hand side you can gaze upon the sweet Scandinavian male form in all its glory in the sauna which is a good example of what we like to do in a past time in this cold country. You get nude a lot, more than later. But the first thing on your right, this is a huge island. It's called Afrasrud, but cool kids call it Afrasrud. And here it used to be the biggest ship factory in the world in the 60s. Then we turned it into something quite different, something Copenhagen must do very well, and it gives very paradise. So you can go in and get microbreweries and food halls for real, of course. It is also the big hall down in the end, where we host Eurovision 2014, and we had something called Copenhagen, one of the biggest metal concerts in all of Scandinavia right there a few weeks ago. You can see McKellar written on the side of the building. That's our most famous microbrewery known around the world. And right next to it, those are four big food stalls. At the right side, you can see a train. It is blue, it is white, and the price is blue. Yeah, that is the bunch jump train. And it is known for what happened in the early 2000s when they had a great marketing idea by saying, hey, it's great for you. the excited faces and all those Chinese people's faces. This, of course, the biggest Chinese magnet for the past 80 years that has been made. And it has been standing on top of this rock since 1913, where it was a gift from a man who gave us probably the best beer in the world, Carlsberg, Carl Jakobsen. He went to the Royal Theatre back then and fell in love with the ballerina playing The Little Mermaid on stage. His idea of romance was asking the woman to sit nude on top of a rock for all the public to see of all the time. As you can imagine, she did not love that idea. So he had to get creative and ask his sculptor friend who asked his wife. So what you have today that many don't know is the head of the ballerina, but the body of the sculptor's wife. She's been through a lot, oh poor mermaid. She's been decapitated twice, had her arm sawed off and had paint poured over her on several occasions. We found one of the heads at our main station for some reason, but if anyone ever goes to Sweden, please ask them to give the second one back. Thank you. We talk a lot of smack about Sweden, and that's for a good reason. It's our neighbor to the north, and we have a world record with them. We have the most wars fought between two nations in world history. For 300 years, we had over 156 of them. But don't worry, in 2000, we built a bridge to them, and all is good. The war is mainly fought on these tourist boats where we make bad jokes about each other in different parts of the world. But we have another neighbor, neighbor to the north, and that's Norway. Norway! stuck around for 300 years longer with the Danes, so they're a bit closer to our heart. But one day, in 1800, they decided to go out and fight themselves. And we said, good luck, Norway, it's tough out there. And then, 50 years later, they found one of the biggest oil depositories on the planet. Last year, one of the biggest lithium mines on the planet. And three months ago, the biggest phosphate depository on the planet. These two acted as the exit terminal when we wanted to leave Denmark and go to Norway. Today we use it to freight the royal family between the coastline and the big royal ship that normally is to your left. Now remember the man who gave us the opera house, Avery Willow Mask. He made a container shipping company the biggest in the world, and this is their headquarters to the right. It is called the building with the blue eyes, and it looks like a bunch of containers stacked on top of each other. That's because, of course, Mask does that more than anyone else. They have kept the Danish naval spirit alive single-handedly by being one of the biggest, the biggest fleet of any private company on Earth. 734 cargo ships sail around the world with Swedish IKEA furniture as we speak. 
It's been here since 1904, and on top you can see a blue flag waving in the wind with a seven-pointed star. Those seven points represent the seven oceans on which they operate, but anyone knowing anyone working for MASK knows that it more likely means the seven days a week. The whole story is that MASK was lost at sea in a small boat, and he was foggy and he could not find home to his love waiting here in the shores of Denmark. And through the fog, he saw the northern star shining through. To us right now, you can see, is where the current King Frederick lives with his four children and his wife Mary. The closest one to us on our left is where his mother, the old Queen Regent Margaret, lives. And mainly, Bobby might be asking why doesn't it look like a Disney castle if the royal family lives there? That is because in 1794, Copenhagen did what it did best and it burned down. So that meant because it's more where all of the kings lived, had to find a new place to live. Thankfully, four poor noble families have just finished building their four new homes, so we kicked them out and put the royal family in there. So for the past 200 years, the Mailey Bob House of the Royal Family. It is something interesting coming up in a moment where you're going to be seeing a symmetrical line going all the way back to the church at the end, ending down at the opera house to your left. This is called the Axis of Power. At the end of the Axis, you've got the Marble Church, the biggest church dome in all of Scandinavia. Also one of the most beautiful ones you can go in for free. It took 145 years to complete, and it makes up the end of the axis, representing one of four pillars of Danish society. Religion with the church, monarchy with the Amalienborg, nature with the Amalienborg garden and the waters we are on, and culture represented by the opera house to your left. So therefore culture, nature, monarchy, and religion in a straight symmetrical line. But if you want to see the men with the funny hats do their shift changes in there, the Royal Guards, it is by the man on the horse in the middle of the square at 12 a.m. every single day. Now the monarchy in Denmark being the oldest in the world means we have had a lot of kings and queens. The further back you go in history, the more kings we had because they had a tendency of killing each other a lot. But thankfully, we cleaned up in the royal line by giving them two names primarily, Frederick and Christian, and there's about ten of each. But the most important one you need to remember is Christian IV, because he is the man who, for one, ruled longer than anyone else. Sixty years, but he's also the guy who doubled the size of Copenhagen in his reign. He turned us from a mid-late city into a renaissance city, and he did so because he came at an interesting time in history. You see, at the end of the 1500s, for one, we were peaking as a Danish nation. We had both Sweden, Norway, and large parts of Germany as part of the country, making us one of the biggest in all of Europe. We also, 50 years prior, had just left the Catholic Church, making us Protestant, which meant when you do that, you get all that sweet Catholic money straight into the monarchy. So when Christian IV arrived, he was the richest king we've ever known, and he knew how to throw a party. The guy at the first day of office filled every single street with free food for everyone, maybe the first food festival in Europe's history. He took every single fountain you see through the whole city and he replaced the water with red wine and he threw gold coins all around the street. So the biggest banger bender Copenhagen has ever seen entered Christian IV's reign. The man was a character and he loved three things above all else. Making love, going to war and getting drunk. Unfortunately, he was only good at one of them, and he had 28 children, so you do the math. Why he lost so many wars, we're going to find out later. But suffice it to say, we lost a lot. We lost to Sweden, Norway, and most parts of Germany, and we became even smaller than we are today. We were also sort of broke. So, Christian IV wasn't done going into wars. He needed more money, so he came up with an idea on how to get it. He built what we're about to sail into in a moment down to the left, called Christianshavn, which means Christian's Haven in his name. He made it in order to lure people who were rich at the time. In the 1600s, that was the Dutch. The Dutch lived in Amsterdam, where they had beautiful canals, and the Christian IV thought to himself, if I want them to come here so I can tax the bejesus out of them, I am going to imitate the canals of Amsterdam. But the problem was, just because you imitate some canals from home doesn't mean they want to leave their friends and family behind, so not a single Dutch person came. But for 400 years, we had Danish people been living down through the canals and houseboats ever since. We're about to sail in there, and I can't speak there, unfortunately, so we are going to be ducking under the bridge, and I'll be going down answering any questions you might be having. But before, there's one more thing in Christian Town most of you probably have heard about, and that is the free town of Christania. Christania was made in 1971 during the hippie revolution, when a bunch of hippies found out that the military had just left a bunch of buildings unattended to. So they went in there, squatted, and said, this is ours now. 
It took two months of politicians complaining until, apparently due to it being the hippie revolution, some of the politicians were sympathetic to the hippie cause and said, you know what, let's make it a social experiment. What's the worst thing that can happen, right? Well, ever since the last 50 years, it's been the most heavy concentration of organized crime in the country. But this year, Pusher Street, where of course you buy all the hippie cigarettes, that got pulled up by every hippie in there. We ripped up every single piece of marble rock that made up the street, and today it's filled with police, Catalade, like the rest of the city. But folks, here comes the bridge. Rest your ears, enjoy the sights. See you in a bit. and two steps all the way to the top, eight euros to enter, and you can get a really nice photo in just a moment. On the bridge, up to the left. Brace for the bridge. Every year when high schoolers graduate, they get to pick one song that they can play in the church bells. So for the past five years, every year we've been listening to mainly Taylor Swift and Beyonce on these very church bells. But there you can see, the glory of the sun lighting it up. Save restriction. Don't worry if you miss the church, you can get a photo of the most photographed tree in all of Denmark. So we have another bridge coming up. This one's extra, extra low. So please take care. Of it.
officially leaving Christian's house, Christian's Haven. And the first thing that greets us on our way out is a bridge designed by a half Icelandic, half Danish artist. It's very popular here in Copenhagen. It's called Olafur Eliasen, and he made this circle bridge. Circle bridge because he thought the Copenhageners were too much in a hurry going from A to B in a straight line. So he made circular bridges so we could sit down and connect. And as you can see, they're empty because Danes don't like to connect. building up in front is a library. It's a modern extension to the old Royal Library from 1898. It stood here in 1999 and it is called the Black Diamond because the main surface in all the black is black marble imported from Zimbabwe and it's angled seven degrees over the water in such a way that when the sun hits the water and is reflected up on the surface it shimmers like a black diamond which is a great idea until you remember we have no sun in this country. And also, the only time of the year where a pony works is 7 in the morning in April. But, you know, April for effort. At the back of it, you can see the old Royal Library that seamlessly mixes in from the old to the new, 1898, behind the Black Diamond. It's the biggest library we have, 175,000 books inside. Free to public choice. But, up in front, we have this big glass building, and right next to it, people dancing souk as a Latin dance every Wednesday. This Blux is DAC, the Danish Architect Center of Denmark, designed by the Dutch for some reason. But it is made in the image of Legos, which is a Danish invention. Lego is a combination of two Danish words, like God, and it means to play well. The idea is that every Danish person who grew up to be an architect found his passion for architecture by playing with Legos. Hence the Architect Center is made in the image of Lego. A very low bridge, please remain seated, thank you. Remember Christian IV, he lost a lot of wars. You are about to find out why in just a moment. First, the bridge. You see, on your right-hand side, we have this big red brick building. This is the brew house of Christian IV. He built this in 1618 because we had a problem in Copenhagen. We had no sewer systems, which meant that our water was pretty filthy. We got sick a lot from drinking it with all the bacteria in it, but thankfully our scientists found a great solution to the problem. When you apparently take dirty water and you brew it into beer, the bacteria die. So we took all of our drinking water and turned it into beer. We put thousands and thousands of liters within the brew house and Christian IV loving the idea so much decreed that every person in the Danish kingdom would get 10 liters of beer every single day to be shared with the whole family, also the children. Afterwards, we lost pretty much every major war we ever went into. Understandably. Some people find this interesting. This uh, boat on the right hand side, Annie Aura, is a massage salon on the water. Ooh, la, la. That other bridge. Uh, on your right hand side, this in here is something called Slottshalm, and it's not as exciting as it sounds, that means Castle Island. It was, the, for the past thousand years, the center of political power in Denmark, where on the other side of it, we'll see in a moment, Christian's Ball, our main castle. But this bridge up in front is pretty, and that's the Marble Bridge. It's pretty because this is the only bridge that did not burn down in 1794 in the whole area, and we had more money back then. So as you can see, this is what Copenhagen would have looked like before the fire.
This bridge leads into the Royal Stables, which is the back end of Christian's Hall. We still have about 20 horses operating today, who are pooing all over where the politicians go to work every single day. The bridge following that one is very important. Water so beautiful. This is Storm Bridge. I'm going to climb up here because it's very important now that we keep our elbows to the inside of the boat because this is the narrowest bridge we have and it's so narrow that this very boat was designed just to go through it. If it was any wider we couldn't go through, if it was any longer we couldn't turn. So very important, keep your arms, heads and elbows on the inside and put your lives in the trusty hands of your captain, Kyle. Upwards, you can see ancient cave paintings from 10,000 BC. As you can tell, quite a tight squeeze, and you might be thinking, wow, this is quite a job. But this is also quite a man sailing this boat. And after the tightest squeeze comes the tightest turn in the whole city. So hold your breath and let's see if Carl is going to make it through in one piece. He already did it seven times today, but let's see if he can do it in the lift. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he did it yet again. Give a big hand for your captain, Carl. Good job, Carl. Ladies, he's single. Now, there's a big yellow building coming up on your right. Can you see it? That's Torbelson. For you Italians, this is a big deal. Because he went to Rome for 40 years, and he was our biggest artist, arguably, in European history, at least in English. Battle Torbelson. This is a museum and his mausoleum. And within these walls, the man is buried. In the 1800s, the beginning of the 1800s, he was sent at the age of 11 to Rome, where he spent 40 years enjoying a polyamorous lifestyle and sculpturing away. He was one of the best sculptures and his work is represented all over Europe. When he was there, he received at a certain point the highest honor you can get in Rome at the time, by being, to history, the only person of non-Italian descent to have his art represented in the Vatican. He made the mausoleum of Pius VII, the Pope at the time, which today is within the Vatican's walls. And as you can imagine, when the man returned home to a very small Denmark, he was welcomed home like a true king. On the side of the building, you could see depicted what it looked like when he returned after 40 years to the Danish coasts with all the people cheering him on. And all of the different things from his drafts. His originals are spread across Europe, but his drafts, the leftovers, he carried with him in ships and were put within this museum right here. The museum was built just for his work, and he is buried in the center courtyard in the middle of the building. Now, can everyone see the man on the horse down to the left? The man on the green horse to the left is one of the most important men after Christian IV in Danish history. That is Absalon, the bishop and the founder of Copenhagen. He was part of a team-up with his adopted brother, Valdemar the Great. And those two brothers transformed Denmark from a Stone Age society into a Middle Age one. It's important because they found out that there was a way to civilize us with two things, religion and politics. He became bishop for that very reason and built thousands of churches across the whole country, which is why you find so many churches when you travel through this country. He was adopted into a very rich family. The family was so rich that their last name was Rie, which means rich. Please start for the bridge. So, Valdemar the Great became king, he became bishop at the 18th century. So, other than building a bunch of churches, half of the city is more or less named as Absalom alone. They built what you see on your right hand side in just a moment, Christian's Paul. Christian's Paul, those two brothers built in 1167, and the original ruins of that first castle you can find in the basement of Christian's Paul in a separate museum. It was rebuilt five times, this building, and it only burned down twice. Christian's Paul, 1167, as said, it was rebuilt. Then it burned down, unfortunately. 
not by the Swedes, not by the Norwegians or the French or the English. It was burned down by ourselves because we forgot candle fire in the windowsill twice. The first time around we got wise and we said we're gonna fill it out of rock so we can't burn it down anymore and as you can see it worked. It's been here, the House of Parliament since 1850 when we got democracy. And within these walls you find House of Parliament, High Court Justice, Royal Reception Halls and of course Commander-in-Chief Mette Flaxen, our Prime Minister within these very walls. The highest point in all of Copenhagen is the spire, 106 meters, and every single day you can go up for free in an elevator and look all over Copenhagen. People never really do it, so please do try it. Here's another bridge. Oops. So as I said, there's a bit of a tradition with this city burning down and the many, many buildings around it. But Thankfully, after the turn of the 1800s, it didn't happen that much more. But that didn't stop this year from coming with a surprise, because on your right-hand side, in just a moment, ladies and gents, I present to you the ruins of Grøsten, which burned down this year, the 16th of April. Unfortunately, and eerily enough, on the fifth anniversary of the Notre Dame fire in Paris. This was built by Christian IV, and it is arguably the first mall in world history. He built it because he thought it rained too much in Denmark, every three days statistically, just not what we needed, but a lot. So he built the mall to be able to trade indoors without getting wet. At the very top of it, it had a spire with four dragons intertwining their tails. Those four dragons representing protection from, you guessed it, fire. But it's the only building, interestingly enough, in the whole area that didn't burn down at least once in 400 years. So maybe the tails did the thing. Rich. All on your right, you see a cozy little bar, kayak bar. Kayak bar has this thing in the summer for tourists. If you want to take a uh, kayak for free, you can do it all summer if you just take a small bucket with you and you clean up trash along the canals as you go. It's one of the initiatives to keep these canals clean because we used to have the filthiest canals in Europe, but today we are proud to have the cleanest. And that is of course because of your help, free tourist labor. So please do help. As you can see, it's also a hipster bar, but nothing's perfect. Have another bridge coming up. Now, Clashen's Ball behind us, that we just left, uh, was center of monarchy for many, many years. But in 1850, we got democracy, which meant no more kings than that. But the building we're about to talk about in a moment was still relevant with the kings because it was 1750 and Christian VI reigned and looked out through his windows in Clashton's Ball. And Nikolai Eidvill, he wanted to build a warehouse, the warehouse that's right in front of us with the green arched doors. He wanted to keep his head and wanted to keep the king happy. So he decided to spend all of his money of this warehouse on the front side of the building. So look at those arches, those green doors, those beautiful roofs, those beautiful windows, pretty like a Renaissance painting, right? Wait until you get to the other side of the building and you can see where the rest of the budget went when you can see the side the king could see. There you have it, the back side of Michael's building where he spent significantly less than the front side. Little man. Now, can everyone see the large bridge going over the canal all the way down there? That is the Inner Harbor Bridge. And that bridge has a bit of a story. It's quite new, but it is a love letter to the Copenhageners' love of bicycling. We bicycle so much here, we go 35 times around the earth every single year. 1.4 million kilometers just to this city alone. It's the third best city on earth to bicycle other than Amsterdam and Utrecht in Holland. Funnily enough, this bridge was built by the Dutch for the Danes. It was supposed to cost 12 million euros, but ended up costing closer to 80. And that is because when the Dutch built the first edition of it, they started on both sides of the canals. And I'm sure you'd agree, the best way to do that once you finish is that they meet in the middle, right? 
not this one. This one went like this. <laughs> so that meant we had to rebuild it and we attached another bridge on the side of it. Which means that this bridge at this very moment goes like this. Which means every single night when people were testing it out in the beginning would bike up and straight into the canal. Hundreds of people straight into the canal until we figured a solution to the problem. We made a glass panel in front of it. Which meant, of course, that you couldn't see it at night. So people smashed straight into that glass panel again and again. And now we're rebuilding it a third time. But love letter to our love of bicycling nonetheless. It has a different type of name as well because normally bridges open up like this. But this one goes back and meets in the middle for what looks like a little kiss. Cute. So, of course folks, if you want a good excuse to give a smooch to someone you care about, if you're on a first date, you are welcome. This is the Pissing Bridge. Welcome ladies and gents, let the love flow. Can you feel the love tonight? Ah, there you go, my guy, okay. Right, we have New Hound right down here, okay? We're almost home, almost done listening to my dumb jokes. But, folks, we have a place in New Hound that a very famous man lived, and that was Hatch Christian Anderson, who, of course, gave us about 157 fairy tales. Many of them, you know. Elsa from Frozen was inspired by the Ice Princess, the Little Mermaid, slightly disnified in the original, Hans Christian made her commit suicide, very Danish, but he made the ugly duckling, the emperor of no clothes, the princess and the pea, and so on. 157 of those while he lived in here in 20 years. If you want a picture of the first place that he lived, it's on the right after this blue boat over here, three windows across, number 67, in between the yellow and the brown big building. 67, over here to your right. He lived here in these canals because at the end of the canal to the left you have the Royal Theatre and he would go there almost every day and get inspiration for all his many plays, poems and plays and fairy tales. But, there you have it. Number 67, first place on a trip by Hans Christian Andersen. He also lived after this bridge, up to the left, in a red and an orange building, number 2018, if you want to picture that too. But, folks, we are almost done. This is the first and the last bridge. It's also the lowest, and I have looked with great pride that no one has got PP on their fingers. Let's make that 15 out of 15, folks, and remain seated without touching. Thank you. It is quite low today due to time, so consider ducking if you're tall like me. Congrats, folks, not a single person touched the bridge. On your left. The twin sandwich is a big part of the Danish cuisine, and on top we traditionally put a lot of fish. That's because in the 1600s, the main way we made money in Denmark was selling a lot of fish. So we had fish on the brain, so much that it's even in our language. To the point, for example, if you are American and you see an attractive woman across the bar, you'd say, wow, that's a hot chick. But in Danish, you'd say, wow, that's a tasty herring. Yeah. On the right hand side, you can see a green building over there where jets, you can take your very own tasty herring in for a little tasty herring. We are at the end of the road, so ladies and gents, I know I make a lot of fun about Denmark and the Danish people and Copenhagen, but this is the city I'm from and I really do love this country. Thank you very much for laughing at my dumb jokes and enjoy the rest of your vacation in Copenhagen. For me and Carl, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I need to do some mooring, which is uh, rope speak for putting four different ropes on the boat. Please wait for me to do all four and then I say you made a part and you made a part. Thank you.